Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Tarot 101 workshop. I'm Tori. Um, I use she, her, and they, them pronouns, and I work at the reference department at the Portsmouth Library in New Hampshire. Um, this event is scheduled to end at 9 p.m., is that correct, Laura? And we plan to be respectful of your time. Um, I'd like to begin this program with our land acknowledgement. The city of Portsmouth is on the homelands of the Abenaki people who have ongoing cultural and spiritual connections to this area. According to tribal oral tradition, Abenaki people have lived in the place now called New Hampshire for more than 12,000 years, since before tribal memory. The Abenaki are part of a larger group of indigenous people who call themselves Wabanaki or people of the dawn and form one of many communities connected as a common language family. Here at the Portsmouth Public Library, we are committed to acknowledging and honoring the human history tied to this land. Now, as for tarot, I'd, I'd like to um, introduce our presenter, Kate Sheraton, who uses she, her pronouns. Um, she is going to be going over some basic tarot theory. Kate is a tarot reader and astrologer who believes that fortunes are created rather than told. Her style is down to earth and conversational and she draws heavily on her previous life as a high school English teacher to ensure that her clients understand the logic behind intuitive information that she provides. Um, Laura is going to link her Instagram and website in the chat for everyone who is interested in looking into her after tonight's program. And without further ado, I'd like to hand things off to Kate. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tori and Laura, and big thanks to the Portsmouth Library for having me back. It's been a little while since I presented um, this material to this library group, but I have a feeling that probably we have some folks from far afield as well. Um, so I will um, introduce myself. That was a great introduction from Tori. That's what I really want you to take away. And what you'll hear me talking about is this idea that fortunes are created rather than told. Um, but yeah, so my name is Kate, just a little background. Again, um, I used to be a high school English teacher for a long time. And so you'll, I think you'll get that vibe tonight. I think I would call my style as a reader and as kind of a, a Zoom <laughs> Zoom workshopper, um, pretty educational, pretty conversational. And again, there will be some um, opportunities for questions and comments. Um, and yeah, I'm beaming into you from Dover, New Hampshire. I'm on the Kachiko River, rapid foaming waters. <laughs> so, okay, um, let's see. Um, yeah, Laura put my info in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and paste what I have here too. It has a few more extra things, including my email address if you want to reach out to me directly. Um, and also another Facebook page that I have, um, which is kind of a side project of mine known as the Spiral Temple. And that is um, kind of sacred circle work facilitating like smaller Zoom um, groups. And so if that's something that is of interest of, to you, you can check that out. I muted myself somehow. Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get started with um, my slides. And, um, you know, if we decide at any point that we have questions and conversation that wants to unfold, we can always um, turn off the slides and, and talk to one another. We are a large group, but that doesn't mean that we won't have time to chat. All right. So here is my info that I just shared with you. And this is Tarot 101. All right. So the first thing um, I would love for you to do, some of you have already introduced yourselves in the chat, which is great. Um, but let's take a moment to just kind of orient ourselves to some of these classic images um, and go ahead and share in the chat uh, which image on the screen here is jumping out to you as one that is resonating with you this evening? I wrote here, which image matches your mood tonight? Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be mood. If you're seeing an image that seems to resonate with a kind of a longer phase that you're in, like something that you've been going through or working with, let's go ahead and share that with one another. Um, I will take a peek at the chat like later in the night, but for the moment, go ahead and use the chat as another channel um, to connect 
with these images and to connect with one another. Again, we are a large group. So this is another way to kind of put in more so you get out more. Um, and I wanna start with this because I wanna impress upon you um, the idea that there aren't any rules to how we use these cards and this tool. There are practices and traditions, but there aren't any rules. So don't worry if you're a total beginner and you, you know, quote, don't know what the card means. That's, we're going to get into that later, but this is an opportunity to just connect. Um, so I see my little badge on the chat going. So it sounds like folks are weighing in and, and choosing a card, pick a card, any card. All right, so I have a couple um, quotations to start us off here to kind of set the tone with what we're what we're here to discuss. So the first one says, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So this is my whole thing. Fortunes are created. They are not told. It is better to know some of the questions than all of the answers. We're going to touch on this tonight, right? This is the idea that you get out what you put in. So you want to approach this tool with really um, thoughtful and heart-centered questions in your heart and in your mind, and you're going to get really heart-centered answers out of this tool. What lies before us and what lies behind us are small matters compared to what lies within us. This is a beautiful quotation that really cuts through that kind of um, preoccupation that a lot of us have with the past and or the future. And this, this concept here in this quote from Emerson really, I think, grounds us in the present moment. And that's something that I really wanna um, share with you tonight as we move through this information. And finally, we'll come back to this quote again later. This is brilliant. This is, you've probably seen this, this is Carl Jung. Uh, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So that's, um, I remember when I first read that quotation, I saw it like on a Facebook post and I like, I gasped. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, you know, I, I hadn't run across it. It just like popped up on my Facebook feed and it totally changed my life. Um, it's so brilliant. This, this, um, this concept and really all of Young's work dovetails so well with tarot and we're gonna touch on that tonight. All right, <clears throat> so in this image, um, we, we're looking at the entire tarot deck. There are 78 cards here. Um, and so tarot cards, they are the ancestors of modern playing cards. Um, they have four suits that later became the playing cards. So on the top here, the first two rows, we'll put those aside for a moment. We'll get back to that. But on this longer row, this top row, you see wands or batons or staves or staves. Um, those later became clubs, cups, chalices, they became hearts, swords became spades, and pentacles or coins became diamonds. Uh, and then over here at the top, we have these special cards known as the major arcana. We'll get into that. And the only one that survived into playing cards is the fool. And he became the joker. He got doubled, I'm not totally sure why, but there he is, the joker, the fool. Um, so, in terms of these minor arcana cards, the only difference, they have aces, just like playing cards. The only difference you'll want to note is that instead of jacks, we have two different cards here. I'm pointing with my mouse here. Um, we have pages and knights, okay? And for some reason, somehow they got smushed into jacks in the playing cards. Um, and so I mentioned this word arcana, right? So there's major arcana on the top, and minor arcana on the bottom. So the word um, arcana, it's a plural word, arcanum is Latin for secret or key. So the idea here is that every single image, every card, all 78 of them is its own key to a spiritual principle. That's the idea here. 
And the major arcana on the top two rows are pointing to spiritual principles that are really deep and really kind of psychological in nature. And also um, you might say they're kind of like soul level, you know, they're happening, you might imagine underneath or beyond the everyday circumstances of, of our lives, which are better represented by the minor arcana. And so these two groups of cards start to work together, right? There's the circumstances and the stuff that's going on, that's the minors. And then the majors kind of point to these deeper processes that again, I would call like soul, the soul's journey, something like this. Um, and throughout the evening, I'll be using some language like soul or spirit, um, you know, or like path or your path, something like this. You can kind of fill in the blank. Like if those words don't resonate with you, whatever words work for you in your own spiritual practice and your own kind of like philosophy or cosmology, that's beautiful. It doesn't, we don't have to have the same language to describe these things, which are really kind of ineffable in nature, right? Okay. So let's go into a little history here, just, just because it's nice to know, you know, the lineage of a tool that we're working with. Um, so on this slide, you can see um, two different images. On the top is what is known as the Marseille deck. And then these bottom three are known as the Visconti Sforza. So they're actually both Italian in origin, even though Marseille sounds French. Um, they're well, the words are in French, but the images themselves, like the tarot is Italian in origin. Um, and we're talking about the Renaissance, right? So we're talking about the mid 15th century in Italy. That's where this, this um, tradition came from. Um, and the images on top, you're looking at the major arcana from the Marseille deck and even though, you know, the colors look different than the slides that we've seen so far, and, you know, it's in French instead of English, if you really take a moment to look closely at these images, you'll see that they are very, very similar to the images that we looked at, um, which, by the way, we'll talk in a moment in more depth about these images that we're working with for the most part tonight are what are, they are known as the Rider weight pack. Rider weight, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, so you can see that they really um, stay pretty faithful to these kind of Renaissance era images. Um, and I will just make a note here because this may be a question that you have. Um, some of you out there may have some divination cards um, in your possession that don't follow this kind of structure you know, from the fool to the magician to the high priestess, um, chances are those cards that you have are what we call oracle cards. So using tarot and using oracle cards, the, the kind of premise of the practice of what we call divination is very, very similar. But the card images and the kind of theory behind the cards are very different. Oracle cards are Typically, they're just channeled directly from source by the author, and they are very unique to that person's whole, you know, work, body of work. Um, the tarot, on the other hand, has a very defined structure that has come down to us from the 15th century, and that's what we're about to kind of like parse out and unpack tonight. Um, so some of the stuff that we talk about towards the end about like actually doing pulling cards, you can apply that stuff to oracle cards, but a lot of the evening tonight is going to be about what I would call tarot theory, right? The structure of this deck that's always 78 cards, that always has 22 major arcana, always, always, even if the images are very divergent from the tradition. So I hope that makes sense. Um, okay. Yeah, so originally from what we know from kind of the history, originally this was a parlor game. It was a card game. I have no idea how you play it, but apparently it was a card game. And then it was by the late 18th century, if not sooner, we know that they were being used for divination. 
Okay. Um, so kind of the associations that we have with tarot, kind of um, the cultural um, flavor of this, of this tradition has a, an intense um, identification with the Romani people, right? And you could see this um, very famous photograph on the left that you might've seen of some travelers. Um, so the Romani, I like to use the word traveler, which is kind of a Western European word. There is of course also the word gypsy, but that is more and more um, being seen as a racial slur. So even though it's very, you know, everywhere, <laughs> that word, I try to avoid that word. So I call these folks travelers. Um, and yeah, so what, what we think happened, what the history is, is that this um, card game, this deck of cards that originated in Italy, began to proliferate throughout Europe and beyond thanks to traveling, you know, semi-nomadic people. And this is kind of where we get these associations with like carnivals, you know, and this is where we get the idea of a fortune teller. Um, and somebody, a friend of mine shared with me a, a thought that she had that was so compelling to me, which was that maybe part of what this tradition is about is about connecting with people that you don't share a language with. If you think about travelers coming in to foreign lands and not knowing the language, like there's something um, we're tapping into our what Jung called the collective unconscious. We're tapping into a um, a pictorial language, an archetypal language that, if you believe Jung's theory, you know all people are born with inherently. You don't have to be taught really what a hermit is, you just kind of know, and then you learn the word in your mother tongue, whatever that is, hermit, you know, whatever. So I thought that was a really cool thought that a friend of mine shared with me. Um, but I want to pause here and just acknowledge, you know, that a lot of our negative stereotypes that we have about the fortune teller archetype are rooted in racism against traveler peoples right, particularly the Romani people, right? So the stereotype of a fortune teller who is a charlatan who's going to swindle you and lie to you and pickpocket you and, you know, string you along or whatever, these are inherently racist stereotypes. So we have a beautiful opportunity in this moment in 2022 to say that we're not going to take that with us. We're going to take this tradition, you know, but we're not going to take these, um, these um, prejudices with us, we, we can, that can end with us. And I think that's such a beautiful um, part of this, of using this tool and, and saying yes to being a part of a really long lineage um, with, you know, a history like any other lineage. Um, okay, so I mentioned um, the rider weight pack that we're working with tonight. Um, and you can see some of the images here in the photograph on the right. And I want to draw your attention to this woman in the photograph who is dressed, you know, very archetypally as a fortune teller, you know, as a seer, a diviner. Um, this woman is Pamela Coleman Smith, and she was the artist of these images. Um, and so more and more people are calling these cards the Smith Rider Weight. Rider was actually the publisher. He just had the money, right? Um, Wait, Arthur Wait was an occultist. Um, and by the way, these cards came out in 1910. So we're talking about the turn of the last century when spiritualism and the Western occult was really having a heyday. Um, seances and this kind of these kinds of associations we have. Um, Arthur Wait was an occultist, and he was a part of a kind of an occult group called the Order of the Golden Dawn. And he channeled, supposedly he channeled these images and then he commissioned uh, Pamela Coleman Smith to paint them. Um, and there is a, a kind of a theory that is associated with this time at the turn of the last century that the tarot has its origins in ancient Egypt. But I think it's kind of dubious about whether that's actually true. I mean, we know for certain the oldest cards are, again, from 15th century Italy. Um, and so I guess it's just, it's just, it's an unknown. Um, but 
that was certainly an interest of Arthur Waits, um, Egyptian symbology and also Hebrew and Kabbalistic images, you'll see layered into um, these images, these famous images that we work with. So we get to work with all of those systems, you know, again, even if the like, the story is speckled or whatever, we still get to work with these systems. And I think that's really beautiful and cool. Okay. Oh, I added this slide. I love etymology. Um, and this has to do with the whole fortune teller stereotype. So we're talking about divination, okay? And I wanted to point out what this word really means. So divination is the practice of seeking knowledge of the future or the unknown by supernatural means. Um, and it comes from, you can see here, the verb to divine, right? Comes from through old French, this word for the for predict, okay? But really, if you look at the bottom, if we dig deeper and we go all the way back, the Latin root has to do with God, right? Or the gods, it's God-like. And we know that, right? The word divine means God-like or holy. Um, and so I just leave this here for you as food for thought about, you know, what is this practice that we're talking about? Are we trying to predict the future? right? Or are we trying to come into greater communion with our, our higher power, you know, God, goddess, spirit, source? Maybe we're just trying to come into communion with that and understand, have a more expanded view, maybe, of our reality. And we'll talk more about that um, as the night goes on. Okay. So the way it works, a little like nuts and bolts here, typically when you pull tarot cards, you use a spread. You don't have to use a spread, but especially if you're really just beginning, I really recommend that, um, that you nail down the spread before you start pulling cards. Otherwise, what happens is it's like you have a sentence, but the words are all out of order and you're having trouble like reading it. Um, this having a spread can really help you. It's like syntax. It gives you structure to the reading. Um, so what you'll do, and I'll demonstrate this at the end of the night, you'll shuffle and pull cards and everybody has a different style of doing that. And you'll place them in the shape of the spread that you've chosen. Some folks flip them over. Some folks place them all face down. Okay. And then flip one by one your call whatever resonates with you. The most famous spread in the world is here on the left. It's the Celtic cross. Okay. And you can see that it traditionally has 10 cards or even 11 cards. Um, and you will see this like in every tarot book that you purchase, you'll see this, some version of this. Um, and so maybe some of you have attempted this because I've even heard folks say that they were under the impression that you had to do this, that this is like, like a card game. These are the rules of engagement and you have to pull a Celtic cross in order to read tarot. That is very much not the case. That's a misconception that's out there. This is an option for you. If it resonates with you, it's a really useful option that is kind of deeply associated with that carnival traveler lineage um, because it gives us a really thorough snapshot of the person that we're reading for, whether that's ourselves or someone else. Um, but as a beginner, if you don't know the cards that well, you know, why are you forcing yourself to interpret 10 cards when you could just be interpreting three or even two or even one? Um, and a really great way to get to know the cards when you are a beginner is just to pull one card every morning, card of the day, and just see how it shows up for you and maybe do some journaling. So those are some thoughts about that. The other thing I wanna point out on this slide before we move on is just that I'm a big believer that we can really get more out of this if we set ourselves up <clears throat> excuse me, with questions and spreads that are like soul centered rather than like grasping at reading the future. Okay. And you can see I've included an example on the right 
from a tarot, you know, um, leader in the community whose name is Lindsay Mack. Um, this is her Instagram handle at the bottom, Wild Soul Healing. She's great. She has a podcast. She's awesome. Um, and you can see that the questions that she crafted in this offering, this spread that she offered, you can see that they're just really like heart centered and soul centered. They're not grasping at the future. There's a hint of the future, you know, but it's not like just, it's not passive, I guess is what I'm trying to say. You won't get as much out of your tarot deck if you're approaching it with a really passive attitude, like tell me what's going to happen. It's much more useful and fruitful for your own personal gro growth and spiritual growth uh, to approach with an active mindset about like, what can I do? Um, or, you know, seeing the cards as like a guide for you is another, another way to think about it. Um, and this just plays back into this quotation where we started the evening, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So this is really not a tool for like revealing your fate. Okay. This is a tool for shining the light of conscious awareness onto those parts of you that are currently unconscious that are keeping you disempowered in your life, disempowered from making your own fate, from creating your own fortune. That's really what this is about. Um, and so on this slide, you can see some examples of questions that are kind of highlighting this shift in perspective, which in my experience, this is a huge shift. There were, I probably played with tarot cards for like 10 years before I had this cognitive shift about what we're really doing, right? That shift from passive to active. So instead of asking what's going to happen in the future, you can ask something like, which card can be a guide for me right now? What's a tool that I can lean on? Instead of asking which option should I choose, like should I stay or should I go type of binary question, you can still ask about the options, but why not get a read on both options? What do I need to know about e each option? And then that maybe that could be card one, card two, and maybe card three is like, how should I approach this decision, right? Um, the next one, will I get the job? How should I approach the interview? What energy should I embody, right? So this is what I would call a disempowering versus empowering, passive versus active questions. And then just one more note before we pause for some questions or comments. Um, I get this question a lot from beginners. What about these things called reversals, right? What do I do if a card is upside down compared to its neighbors? Do I have to memorize 78 meanings times two? Because a lot of books that you purchase will be structured that way. Like there's one meaning for upright and there's a second meaning for reversed. Um, and my thought about that is, well, first of all, stop trying to memorize anything. You know, that's that's not going to be a useful way to create a relationship between you and the cards. And we're going to get into the theory behind the structure of the suits so that you don't feel like you have to memorize 78 discrete separate meanings, right? Um, the other thing about reversals is that you literally don't have to use them if you don't want to. There are lots of readers out there, including seasoned professionals, that do not use reversals. If a card ends up upside down, they just flip it over. And this makes a lot of sense to me, even though I do use reversals, it makes sense to me because it's like everything already contains its opposite, okay? So if the card represents an energy, then the deficiency or the absence or the blockage or the distortion of that energy is also represented by its symbolism. You know what I mean? Um, so you can see at the bottom, I wrote, you know, some typical things that we associate with reversals. They're like these opposite, like upside down day type of things. The energy is blocked. It's delayed. It's distorted somehow. It's untapped or potential. It's not here yet. 
or it's ending, it's shifting, it's been here and now it's leaving, right? You can see that there's a number of ways to go with it, um, but you don't actually need to read reversals to go to any of those meanings. You need to create a relationship with your intuition so that when a card arrives in a reading, you can sense into what it's really trying to say. Um, and later when we do the demo at the end, I will make a plug for using a pendulum. Here's my pendulum, if you can see my little video in the corner. Um, this is a really useful tool for getting into these little nooks and crannies of nuance, particularly with reversals, but, but also with upright cards. Okay. So we're gonna pause there if there are any questions about anything that I've covered so far. Um, and I'll take a peek at the chat in this moment. Cool, okay, so I see a question in the chat from Linda about the deck that they have tonight is the Aquarian Tarot. Um, so the, the images in that deck are particularly faithful. I also have a copy of that deck. It's a super famous one. Um, it's beautiful. And the images are pretty faithful to the images that you see here on this slide. Um, anything that you purchase that is labeled tarot is going to match up to what you're seeing on this slide. However, some artists have diverged from these traditional images so far that um, it might be difficult for a beginner to interpret the images, to understand what you're looking at, particularly because every book out there and every website that you Google is gonna use these images that you're looking at right now. So it's useful to have some version of these images in your possession when you're learning because that's just what the resources are all about. Um, and there are some decks out there that are in the Marseille style that do not have any images at all on the minor cards. They just have three swords, you know, uh, uh, seven pentacles, <laughs> like they look like playing cards. Um, so that's not so easy for a beginner either. Okay, beautiful. On the three card layout, what does number three say? Beautiful. Yeah, so this was from, again, this was from Lindsay Mack. One, what am I being invited to leap into this month? Two, what card is helping me to trust this leap? And three, where am I ready to undergo a rebirth? Yeah, so again, I love those questions because they're so brave and soul-centered and deep. They're not like, does he love me? Does he love me not? <laughs> you know, which is fine. It's fine to have those types of, you know, kind of like, will I meet a tall, dark and handsome stranger? <laughs> those kinds of things that, that we associate with tarot. It's totally fine to go to your deck in that way. Um, but I think it's also really beautiful, especially when we're reading for ourselves, you know, to be brave enough to dig really deep. Yeah. Oh, great question about efforts by some to decolonize the tarot. Yeah. So there's a lot. Tarot, you know, is very popular right now. That's why you're here. Um, and yeah, there are a ton of decks on the market right now that have done a really beautiful job to um, diversify these images. Um, all of the, the figures you see in these images are Caucasian. They're European. They're white people. They're, for the most part, pretty gendered, although there's actually a number of ambiguous kind of non-binary type archetypes here, but for the most part, it's pretty kind of, you know, heteronormative, like take a peek at the two of cups, you know, with this kind of hetero looking couple. Um, and so, yeah, there are tons of decks out there. Um, and I wish that I had a handy list of suggestions. I do not, um, but that might be something we can add to an email after the fact. Um, yeah, that's such a, there's so many beautiful resources out there. Okay, if you do the card of the day, would you just ask a question and then interpret the card? Or is there a particular question used in that way? Great question, Jen. Um, I think that's totally up to you. I think it doesn't have to be any more complicated than just like, what is the theme for today? 
And I think a lot of folks that do a card of the day like it as a practice because it's like a detective thing where it's like, here's the theme. And then you are doing detective work throughout the day to determine, well, where am I seeing it? Like, how, how am I seeing it? And the thing is that you're always going to see it no matter what, because fundamentally, this is a tool for making meaning out of your life, right? So, and that doesn't mean that it's like, it doesn't mean that we're like making it up or that it's like fake, you know, it like that's, that's precisely what you're supposed to do. So you could take like any event in your life and choose any of the 78 cards and you could like tell me how it connects. Right. And that's, that's not like cheating. That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> so, yeah. But if you have a question on your heart in the morning, when you're pulling a card of the day, go ahead and ask the question that the tarot, the, this tool, this kind of, um, the spirit of this tool, like really wants you to ask what's on your heart. And if you try to hide what's on your heart, it's, it's, it's going to see right through you. It always does. That's the joke people have about tarot cards. They're very tough love. <laughs> they show you things that you don't really want to see, right? That are unconscious. They make them conscious. Beautiful. Okay. Let me take a sip here. If there's any last questions, go ahead and type. Or if you want to just like go for it and unmute yourself, go for it. Okay, so we're going to dive into more of the nitty gritty here. So we're going to start with the minor arcana, and then we'll move on to the majors. <clears throat> so again, these um, are very, very similar to playing cards. You have a sense of how this works. Um, and again, these cards, when they come up in a reading, they are pointing you to the specific life circumstances that are kind of... Um, on, on the table, literally, and um, on the table for your examination and your reflection. Um, and again, this is an area where like, you might think that you're asking about your job, but then you get a bunch of cups, um, which make you start thinking about your relationship. And you don't really get to choose um, what is being shown to you. That's, that's why this is such a powerful tool, in my opinion. Um, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so here's the deal. This is why, like this information on this slide, and you feel free to screenshot this, by the way. I'll try to, um, I think last time Laura um, was able to send everyone an email with some of this info. Um, but if you are taking notes tonight and you wanna screenshot stuff, please feel free. Um, this slide right here is like the code breaker, okay? This is gonna, um, save you from having to memorize individual meanings for each card because now you have a, a paradigm and you have these four buckets to put the cards in the suits right so these um the way it works is that we're talking about elemental energy this is these are the same four elements that are the foundation pretty much to like all of the western occult esoteric world um, and we'll even take a detour about astrology shortly um, so you maybe are familiar with this stuff already it's also um similar but not identical to kind of like eastern cosmology and like chinese you know chinese medicine and so forth um, and you can see i've used the phrase yin and yang here so on the top we have wands and swords wands correspond to fire swords to air these are both yang energies or masculine energies right this isn't about male female it's just about masculine and feminine which each of us is expressing in our unique way you know which isn't which ultimately is not binary right um and then cups are water pentacles are earth and these are our yin or feminine uh elements and one way I like to think about this is that yang energy is active, whereas yin energy is receptive. Yang is externalizing, yin is internalizing. And so 
these are kind of, these are ways that we can feel into these um, energies. I won't belabor this slide by reading every word. I'll just leave it up for a few moments here um, so that you can take in some of the keywords that I've included here. Okay, beautiful. I do see another question from you, Linda, and we'll get to that. I won't forget. All right. So little detour, and I'll try not to go on a big tangent here, um, but I want to include a little bit about astrology because I think that um, if we can start to identify how these core elemental energies move in us and around us and really feel them, um, then that's like half the battle with learning how to read tarot because ultimately um, these images are meant to bring you into a conversation with your own intuition which is you know at the end of the day it's a felt sense you know about what is real in the in the field right the psychic field and the kind of like uh you know emotional bodies right um and so you probably know, pretty much everyone knows their sun sign. Just in case you don't, um, you can take a peek at the dates here. And as we move ahead, I'll use myself as an example. I was born on May 24th, and so I am a Gemini. Okay. And I can see on this slide that Gemini is one of the three air signs. Okay. So you can take a peek at the column that you are in. And now you have information that maybe you didn't have before about your element, okay? And your neighbors with the same element. And then if we look over here at the rows of this table, this is what we call the energetic modalities. And this might be new information for a lot of us tonight. Um, using myself as an example, again, Gemini, is the only air sign that is mutable. And it's the only mutable sign that is air, right? And so, okay, what do these words mean? So the cardinal signs in the top row, um, if this is you, the idea is that you are expressing your element in a way, in a vibration, a frequency that is moving in a definite direction you are initiating all the time <laughs> with your energy, right? That's cardinal. Fixed signs are the ones who, well, you know what fixed means, right? They're, they're still, there's a stillness to fixed signs. It's almost like they're radiating their energy out from a center, or maybe they're pulling their energy toward them, but they themselves are not doing a lot of movement. They're like, um, stabilizers. Um, they're like continuing their energy. And then the mutable signs are the ones who take their element, again, fire, air, water, earth. If that's you, you're taking your element and you're responding with it to other vibrations and frequencies that are in your field, whether they're your element or a different element, you're responding that's mutable, you're changeable, you're responsive. So this is kind of an imperfect um, way to understand yourself because you are a lot more than just your sun sign. You also have a rising sign and a moon sign, Mercury, Venus, Mars, right? Um, but it's a good kind of way in, again, to starting to feel these elements and how they move in us and around us. Um, and so if we go back to this slide, go ahead and kind of zero in on your element of your sun sign and go ahead and look at those keywords and just take a moment to ask yourself, you know, does that resonate? Is that what I'm about? Is that what I'm about? And, you know, it's totally fine if the answer is no, because <laughs> it might not be, um, but this is good food for thought. Okay, so now we have a sense of the four suits. 
but what about the numbers, right? So on this slide, you're looking at, you know, this is like very um, simplified. It's a lot more kind of deep than this, but these, this is kind of like a cheat sheet. Um, this cheat sheet shows you a single keyword for each number. And then in the images, I've just pulled some of my favorites from the four suits. So you're gonna see different um, elements and suits represented. So <clears throat> there's a journey here from the aces, which represent potential, all the way to the tens that represent the end of one cycle and the beginning of another. And you can see some different keywords in between. And, you know, just a note about the tens, you're looking here at the 10 of swords, which is a very famous image. Um, if you ever saw the movie Now and Then, this card has a cameo with Janine Garofalo, who plays like the hippie <laughs> 60s tarot reader, very kind of stereotypical um, scene. Um, and I just want to say here, and we'll mention this again, I think later, that when we see images of death in the tarot card, like the Ten of Swords, the Tower, the Death card, what is dying? It's not about someone dying, okay? It's about the death of a lower, it, like less authentic version of you that is standing between you and your path, you know, your destiny. Um, and I, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but I love to think about the concept of destiny with tarot rather than fate. You know, like they seem like synonyms and yet there's something more active about the word destiny and fate feels more passive, you know? So that's just kind of a side note. Um, okay, so the last thing I'll say on this page, um, and this is, this might feel kind of like too much information. So, you know, take it if it's useful and leave it if, if you're not ready to kind of think about this. But um, this was another code breaking moment for me when I learned through my studies um, a way to read court cards that I think is very useful. Um, so a lot of times in traditional books, you will see uh, definitions of the court cards that indicate that they refer to other people. So like in the querent's life, the querent being the person that you're reading for, whether that's you, yourself, or someone else. So you'll see in these old school books that, you know, a page represents a young man. No, I'm sorry, a page represents a, a young person, male or female. A knight represents like, you know, an eligible man. <laughs> a queen represents an older woman and a king represents an older man. So I'm kind of laughing because that's something that needs to get decolonized. That's like gendered and like, you know, I don't know, age oriented or something. Um, that might be useful to you to read them in that way um, as a divinatory meaning. Um, but I think it's also equally useful to think about this idea of elementation. So the idea here is that the court cards are double elemented. So they, uh, what we're talking about when they come up is whatever the suit is. But then the face value of the card gives us a second element that tells us a little bit about how we're the person that we're reading for, you know, is like approaching that part of their lives that's represented by the suit. Okay, so that maybe that's confusing. So um, I'll use the Queen of Cups as an example. Um, and by the way, I've included on this slide the double double of everything. So page of pentacles is earth of earth. Knight of wands is fire of fire. Queen of cups, water of water. King of swords, air of air. Um, and there's a whole kind of class of tarot decks known as the Thoth or Thoth decks. And I believe they're all listed just this way. So queen of cups, water of water. Well, this is like using our water energy to work on water concerns. So if your water concern is that you've just gone through a breakup and you're completely heartbroken, 
and drowning in your own emotions and you pull the queen of cups as advice, then maybe what you really need to do is allow yourself to draw a long bath, get in and like let it rip and cry, right? And cry those tears, those um, that water of emotion, let it out. You know, that would be maybe something that the queen of cups would support. Um, and the, I think just to, you know, put a point on the queen of cups, I think what she would represent what she she would say if we could talk to her is that in doing that release you will receive information from your intuition because that's one of our key words right with water it's not just about emotions it's about intuition so that was just an example of the queen of cups okay so we'll take a pause here if you have any questions um in general, or, you know, specifically about the minor arcana, this would be a great time to um, get those out of the way. And just taking a peek at the chat to get us started on questions. Um, there's a couple of questions about the slides. That's great. Linda had a question about um, books. So I said, I had said earlier that when you buy a book, it's going to use these images. Um, and what I meant by that was, if you buy like a long form book that's like a how to read tarot, like tarot theory type book, um, that is a different type of book than the booklet, okay, that comes with decks when you buy them. So there are lots of decks out there that come with like a teensy tiny little leaflet that comes with the cards. Um, but there's also decks that have kind of an optional, like longer book that the artist and the author have, you know, have created um, that are meanings for their images that are channeled from source through them, you know, in their own unique way. Those books are awesome. And uh, I guess we would call them guidebooks. Um, so you might have in your collection a mix of guidebooks and guide booklets and these other types of books, um, like a famous one is called 78 Degrees of Wisdom by um, Rachel Pollack, I believe. Um, and I can include a little reading list um, in the email that, that we send out through the library. Yes. Okay. What about decks that have princes and princesses? Are those pages and knights? Yes, indeed. Yeah, I, I'm thinking that the princesses are probably the pages um, and the princes are knights because there is a hierarchical level. And of course the world is deeply sexist. <laughs> so the, the princesses are at the bottom of the, of the ladder. Um, yeah, okay. Any other questions about the minor arcana before we move on and go ahead and unmute yourself if you'd rather talk than type. Okay, beautiful. All right. So, oh, I'm, I think it was on my slide, but I'll mention that the minor arcana are sometimes called pips um, and the major are called trumps. So we're moving on to the trumps here. Um, these images, a lot of these are super famous. You've seen them before. The Led Zeppelin album has the hermit on there, right? Okay. Um, so what we're really working with, particularly with the majors, although to some extent also with the minors, we're working with archetypes, right? So if you look at the, the bottom definition there that's labeled psychoanalysis, this is our old friend Jung again. So this is a, a term that he kind of popularized in his work, and it means a primitive mental image inherited from the earliest human ancestors and supposed to be present in the collective unconscious. So again, this is the idea that I mentioned earlier that part of what we're doing when we use tarot is we're tapping into that thing, that field, that psychic field that we call the collective unconscious. We're tapping into these um, archetypal images that have an energetic charge even, okay, that um, is so ancient 
that it's almost in our our DNA or like it's in our we're wired in our minds and our psyches, right? We're wired to respond to this information, you know, and this is similar also to kind of like fairy tales, you know, and the types of recurring or folk tales, you know, the recurring characters and types that we see across the world. Famously, there is the idea, you know, of, of the dragon. There are dragon-like creatures in cultures all across the world that had no contact with each other. So where does that come from? You know, Jung would say that it comes from the collective unconscious. So he took this further and he actually coined this term synchronicity. And I'm weaving this in because the more you work with your tarot cards, the more you're gonna start experiencing this. So synchronicity is the simultaneous occurrence of events which appear significantly related but have no discernible causal connection. They're just uncanny somehow. And Jung said that synchronicity often occurs in our lives when there is an activated archetype present. In other words, when archetypal energy is in your psychic field, when that charge is activated in your world, that's when synchronicity happens. And so tarot then can be used as a tool for interpreting synchronicity, right? It's like when these synchronicities are happening and when you're in a phase of um, a, a density of those experiences, your, your purpose with the tarot is to, is to like reveal what the universe is trying to say to you. Because the message is never about the synchronicity, like if you keep seeing 1111 on the clock, you can look up, what does 1111 mean? You can totally look that up, but I'm of the mind that the universe is just trying to get you to open your eyes to something beyond that. It's not actually about 1111. Does that make sense? Um, so those are some thoughts about kind of the woo-woo <laughs> stuff that is available when we tap into the tarot. So all of this is kind of illustrated so beautifully by the magician card, this famous image. Um, and this image is really illustrating these principles, right? As above, so below. As within, so without. As the universe, so the soul. And the idea of tapping into these cards and using these images for self-reflection the idea is that we're taking as an assumption and as our premise that what is happening in our world in this kind of incarnation is somehow intimately connected to our higher power. Again, whatever word uh, resonates for you, I have the word universe here. I tend to use the word spirit. You might use the word God, goddess, right? whatever that is for you, we're taking as our assumption that every moment of this lived experience that we're having is connected. And in fact, we're inviting information to come from that kind of, you might imagine, higher place or this other realm, you know, the other world beyond the veil, they say we're inviting information to come down to us from that etheric or spiritual realm. And we're accepting responsibility also for making that information or that potential, that energy, making it manifest in the material world. And that's what's represented by this image of the magician. He is a bridge between heaven and earth. And each one of you here tonight is a bridge between the spiritual and etheric realms and this 3D material realm where somehow we've all found ourselves on Zoom together. <laughs> it's like, okay, you're a bridge between those things. Okay, couple other thoughts here to help us kind of grok what these images are about. 
we can look at this group of 22 cards as the fool's journey. This was a phrase um, popularized by Mary Kay Greer, another famous tarotist. Um, and she loved to look at the numbers and the, the Kabbalah numerology stuff. And she split these cards into three rows with the fool at the top. And she called it life, death, and rebirth. And so that first row, life, we might think of as ego development. You know, what are my powers and how do they work in the world? In the second row, death, we have to take responsibility, right? With great power comes great responsibility. So if you really want to be the magician of your own life and make magic and make spiritual potential manifest, which I think you do because you're here, then you have to take responsibility for it, right? You get, um, you have to pay the consequences, which are kind of determined in justice. And then you pay those consequences in the hanged man. And then you die and are reborn to a greater and more, more authentic expression of self in death. Um, and so again, we can think of death as the death of the lower self. Um, or if higher, lower doesn't feel good with that hierarchical language, I love to think about it as authentic, inauthentic. You know, whole and integrated and healed or fragmented and wounded. The fragmented, wounded, inauthentic self is what dies in the death card. And in the third line of the tarot, we have rebirth, where we are reborn into higher consciousness. Again, if we don't want to say higher, maybe we can say wider or more expanded. And we can really see that um, in the world card. And really all of these images, if you look, the first line is all figures, seated figures. Except for the lovers, we have two figures here, right? And then things start to get a little bit weirder in the second line. Like, look at the Wheel of Fortune, right? And then the third line is totally psychedelic. All of these images are, these are not literal images. These are like densely, densely symbolic images, right? And so that's that idea of expanded consciousness. So this right here, this slide right here is, again, a little bit of theory that can help you create some kind of paradigm, some buckets to put these cards into so that when they come up in a reading, you have a little bit more to hang your hat on. This is a slide, this is overwhelming. So we'll make sure that this gets emailed to you. Um, this is a slide that I created where I just cross-referenced a bunch of books that I like. Um, so there's a little reading list, actually, if you look at the fine print here. Um, I just cross-referenced cross them and kind of syncretized them into a little cheat sheet here. Um, so these are just some keywords. So we're not going to belabor this slide in the interest of time and, and keeping it keep keeping things moving. Um, but if you'd like to take a moment and locate the card that you um, noticed at the beginning, and maybe you put in the chat, um, if you came late, uh, I just asked everybody at the beginning of um, the program to think about an image that um, resonated with them. Um, if you don't have one in mind, uh, go ahead and look at these words and pick a word that's resonating with you. An archetype that feels like it's here for you. And then you can take a peek at some of the keywords that I have here. Yeah, beautiful. If you'd like to say something in the chat about your card that you're thinking about tonight, um, go go ahead and share it. Things become more uh, real when we when we speak them aloud or when we type them. So go ahead and do that if you feel called. Okay, so we're gonna take another quick detour to astrology. Um, beautiful, yay, okay. Um, so, you know, again, I just wanna say if this, if these next few slides feel like overwhelming to you, like if they're making this seem harder instead of easier, 
then please just feel free to leave this and don't feel that um, you have to associate tarot with astrology. You really don't. But if you'd like to, if that makes it easier for you, then we can do that now and it will give you more of a toehold to understand this tool. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's suggested but not required reading, I guess we'll say. Um, but I think a lot of us are more familiar with astrology just like in the culture. So I'm hoping this will be helpful rather than harmful. So, okay, the idea here is that all 22 cards have an association with an astrological principle. So I have listed only the zodiac signs here, um, but the other cards are planets. So the fool is Uranus, the magician is Mercury, the high priestess is the moon, and so on and so forth. But just in, in the interest of keeping it clear, we'll just talk about um, sun signs or, or zodiac archetypes, I should say. Um, so you can go ahead and take a peek at your sun sign, which we talked about earlier, um, and take a peek at what your card is. And again, I'll use myself as an example. I am a Gemini. So I noticed that that card is associated with the lovers. Um, that one's a great example of one that seems obvious. Gemini is the twins, right? So the lovers looks like the twins. Not all of them are as obvious, um, but we'll dive in a little bit deeper in the next slides. All right. so. I took these screenshots from tarot.com. Um, so actually I kind of lied earlier because these images that they used are not the Rider weight. Um, I'm not sure, I didn't write down which deck it is, but um, I like it. It has kind of an eighties, nineties look to it and I like it. Um, so if you are in the first half of the Zodiac, Aries through Virgo, take a moment now to read your little tarot horoscope and see what you think. And we'll make sure you have this information later as well. Okay, cool. I think Jasmine's saying that this is the cosmic tarot. The cosmic tarot. Nice. Okay. So we'll move on to the second half, Libra through Pisces. And you can go ahead and find yourself or maybe find a loved one. Okay. So, you know, the idea here is that both tarot and astrology are symbolic languages. They're archetypal languages. So Capricorn is an archetype precisely as the devil is an archetype, but it's kind of like they're similar, but they're not identical. So Capricorn shares a vibration or a frequency with the devil, but it's not the same thing. You know, they're different systems that have just been, um, like woven together over centuries, right? In the Western occult kind of like space. Um, so again, this isn't required, but you may find it helpful in, in interpreting the cards. And if you are um, kind of well-versed in astrology, or if you're, you know, if you consider yourself an astrologer, then you may find that in your readings, that's part of what you're feeling called to interpret. Like that, that if you pull the star, you are meant to think about Aquarius placements in your own chart, Aquarian people in your life, you know, in your life, that's kind of up to you. The sky's the limit in terms of how you'd like to use this information that, that we've shared. Okay. So we'll pause there. If there are any questions, 
about the major arcana specifically or any kind of general questions before we move into kind of a demo and a how to. I'm a little confused about the wheel of fortune. Yeah. Are you thinking of this slide back here? Um, the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> chance and karma leaving all to chance. Okay. I, only because that's the one that I chose and I'm, I'm confused. Yeah. Okay. So let's, we'll pause here. I kind of breezed over this slide. So let me, let me explain my methodology a little bit more and maybe that will help. So um, again, I pulled a lot of these words from um, sources. So I want to be clear that these are not all my words. Like I've, I've smushed a lot of things together that I, that I liked um, from my studies. So, um, okay. The wheel of fortune. So the way that I've set up this chart, if you look up here at the top row, we have the major arcanum that we're talking about, the Trump that we're talking about, and there's two chunks. Um, but then I wrote here, key principle is on top, but then underneath in italic font, I've included this idea that I find useful of, well, what would it mean if that key principle was present in excess or was blocked or was, you might say, deficient in the field? And by the field, I mean the psychic field of you and the person you're reading for, whether that's yourself or someone else. So in other words, we have three things to work with in this chart for each um, Trump. And so the main idea of the wheel of fortune is fortune, <laughs> chance, karma, you know, good luck, bad luck, this kind of thing. But if you have wheel of fortune energy in your field in a way that is uh, like in excess or is like, uh, like, yeah, too much, then that might be, that might be pointing to an attitude where you're just like leaving things all to chance. And you're saying, well, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Like, guess there's nothing I can do about that. Or you're feeling um, despondent because you feel powerless in your life. And you're like, well, I just got dealt a bad hand and I'm screwed. And that's just the way it is, right? That would be almost what we might call a shadow of the wheel of fortune energy. It's like, it's like wheel of fortune is distorted. On the flip side, if that card is coming up for you, but you're being pointed to the blocked or the deficient expression, right? It would be maybe like ignoring karmic patterns, like ignoring um, the bigger view about, um, you know, the lessons. Karma is really about like lessons that we're supposed to learn through our mistakes and through, you um, kind of like the, the, um, the periods of bad luck or ill fortune that each one of us must go through, whether it's through our own, you know, again, mistakes or just through the game of life. Um, if, if the wheel of fortune is deficient or blocked for you, it might represent that you're not like willing or able to take that bigger view and to see yourself as operating in a larger pattern, you know, of, of karma. Um, and the word karma might not resonate with you, but that's kind of a, a concept that comes up with this card. Um, so I don't know who asked that question, but does that kind of help or what are you thinking at this point? Yeah, okay. that does, that does help. It, um, yeah, I, at first it just said, um, I was reading, leaving all to chance and ignoring karmic patterns. And I mm -hmm. thought, well, that's all very negative. <laughs> yeah. So all the words in italics are negative. Um, and the words up top are more kind of neutral. Um, and so, yeah, you know, a part of me feels like maybe this slide is too negative. Um, but I really feel like the tarot is very sassy. <laughs> and I feel like it's often pointing us to um, these distortions, you know, distortions. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Yeah. And Jasmine has a great comment in the chart in the chat. Excuse me. I felt that shadow energy of the wheel of fortune all my life. I love how the tarot calls you to take responsibility for these things. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. That's, that's the name of the game. Okay. Any other questions um, that you think might be, that might benefit, you know, the group? I don't want to go into too many questions about your own kind of like, you know, what you're, what you're working with in your life or anything like that. We don't have quite enough time for that. Um, but anything about kind of understanding this page um, or really anything that I've shared so far, let's just take a moment and make sure that we're feeling up to speed before we move on. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about kind of practical application. You know, how are we going to do this? And I'll do a little demo as well. Um, I have this image here. This is an image from a, my altar. I have a little, uh, it's like a end table, actually. I have a little table in my bedroom um, with a cloth on it that I use for doing tarot spreads and also kind of taking images from the different decks that I own um, and propping them up in these ways that are meaningful to me at the time. And so this is an image of my altar when I was working with the hanged man and the two of pentacles. And I, I don't even remember what was going on in my life that felt like this was what, re this represented it. This was years ago, but these were cards that were really speaking to me. And I wanted to share this image with you because I wanted to encourage you again, you know, as I said at the beginning of the program, there are no rules about how to use these cards. So once you pull them, that doesn't have to be the, the end of it. You can work with these cards and, you know, meditate on them and, and even converse with them in a way that it doesn't, you know, um, it doesn't have to just end with the reading. This is a practice that goes really well with really like depth journaling. Um, and that can happen in conjunction with that guidebook that came with your deck or with a longer form um, text like 78 Degrees of Wisdom. You know, there can be a, a, a study component and I think there should be because there's a lot to learn. But ultimately, um, that kind of psychological, like therapeutic work, journaling, meditating, you know, attuning yourself to these archetypal energies, that's, that's where the work really is. That's what makes this such a powerful and, and really transformative tool. Um, so on this slide, these are some tips about kind of the, the other like accoutrements that people usually have, none of these are required by any means. You can read tarot, you know, on the floor with nothing but your cards. That's totally fine. But if you want to create a little more ritual around this practice, I would encourage you to do that. Um, I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, but here's the list. So um, traditionally, folks wrap their cards in cloth rather than just keeping them in the cardboard box that they came in. Um, and this is just, you know, to protect the cards um, and show them a little love and respect. Um, and typically you would use that cloth to conduct the readings so that your cards are never really touching the table bare. Um, you know, practically speaking, you don't want any like, you know, honey from your tea getting on your cards and that kind of thing. Um, traditionally, these cloths are um, made out of silk or cotton, and they're purple or dark blue or gold or kind of these colors that we associate with higher vibrations. If you think about the chakra system, like violet is at the top, right? So again, totally optional, but I just thought that was interesting, and I wanted to mention that. Most readers um, will read with a candle. Oop, and... <laughs> I was going to show you my candle and I just totally knocked it over. 
that'll be great in the YouTube. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to move my screen now and show you my tools, which are of course covered with wax. That's another reason to have a cloth because then your cloth gets covered instead of your table. So I don't know if this is going to work. It's to my left here, so I don't know. Um, maybe I'll maybe I'll do this afterwards when I stop this screen share. I apologize. Um, I'll go through all the tools again. Um, but I have these next to me. Um, a candle, uh, when we light a candle the way I see it, we're inviting um, spirit, however you define it, into the space. And um, we're also saying when we light a candle, we're saying that we're in a different kind of space than we were before. We were in mundane space, and now we are in holy space. That's what a candle says to me. Um, using a bell or sacred smoke of some kind is a way to clear the space of unsupportive energies, you know, just kind of the mucky muck that, that's, you know, potentially blocking us from a clear channel. We're trying to be a clear channel when we read. Um, it can be helpful if you like, if you're into crystals, it can be helpful to have quartz or another crystal that is considered clearing um, or like programmable, um, that's quartz. Uh, that's a good way to go ahead and open your channel more, more clearly. And I already mentioned that I'm a big fan of having a pendulum to answer yes or no questions. Um, and particularly with the reversals, I find it can be useful. Other tools that I suggest, a journal, as I mentioned, and then um, if it feels um, in alignment for you and it feels like a part of you know, your journey with this tool, I think it's beautiful to have an altar space of some kind. Um, there's a whole practice that you can Google and read about that folks call path work. Um, and I, think, I don't think this is exclusive to tarot, this idea. It's um, essentially, it's a visualization practice. Um, it's a meditative practice where you're kind of gazing upon a card and attuning to its frequency, and then you're imagining yourself entering into the scene that's depicted, um, and maybe even having a conversation with the figure or the figures that you find there. Um, and it's it's kind of um, yeah, it's a it's a almost like a shamanic type of practice. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that, um, you know, you can weave into your relationship with this tool that really goes beyond the traditional framework of like doing a spread and interpreting a spread. And it really just um, expands the potential here to um, cultivate a really intimate relationship with your own intuitive faculties, you know, your own your own spiritual path, your own intuition, your own, um, you know, mediumship or psychic powers, th these kinds of things. If, if that's kind of why you're here and why you're interested, um, then I really recommend doing that kind of deeper work um, that goes beyond the, the single reading. Okay, so um, if you have cards with you, uh, I invite you to kind of uh, get them ready. Don't pull cards yet. I'm going to do a demo. So don't pull them yet. Don't shuffle yet, but just grab your cards, get them ready. You know, if you don't own a deck yet, no worries at all. You can just stay with us and receive um, this last part before we move into questions and comments. Um, I am going to do a demo. Um, and as you're kind of preparing your cards and preparing your space, you know, if you have a candle, if you have a cloth, great. If you don't have those things handy, there's really, you really don't need them. They're not required by any means. Um, and if you have a notebook, that's great too. Again, not required. But if you'd like to jot down in your notebook, one of these two spreads um, I think maybe some of you were writing down this one on the left is the same one we looked at from Lindsay Mack. Um, if you'd like to use that, you can go ahead and start to write down those questions in advance. But if these questions just feel like too much, 
you know, if, if um, just it, interpreting what the questions mean and reading them is like, whoa, too much, then let's just keep it simple. Let's just do past, present, future. And again, when we're talking about future, we're not grasping. We're not trying to know what's gonna happen. We're trying to maybe imagine ourselves as swimming through the river of time and trying to get a feel for what the current is that's opening before us, not so we can control it, but so that we can navigate it with grace and ease. That's how I would conceptualize a future card in a, in a spread. Okay. So I'll give folks a moment to get themselves prepared. If you'd like to pull cards tonight, you certainly don't have to. You can certainly just remain open and receive what, what we're doing here. Um, and as folks get their space ready and kind of get themselves oriented, if there are any questions lingering, Let's go ahead and take some questions now. You can unmute yourself or you can type in the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the share for the moment and I'm gonna try <laughs> to get the camera onto my waxy table. Yes, question in the chat. Can we still pull cards if we do not have all the tools? Absolutely. The tools are totally optional. I wanted to um, give them to you so that you're aware of some of the lineage, but you don't need to run out and go spend money. That's like not the message that I would ever give. Um, totally, totally optional. Yes. Okay. And there's a question here about cards popping out. I'm going to address that. Linda has a nice question here. Shall we just draw from three from the major arcana? Um, that was not my intention. I, I've done that in the past, actually, in these groups. I think that's a cool way um, to like really get to know the majors. Um, and if you have them separated out, you know, feel free. But that's not my intention. We're going to pull from the full deck tonight. OK. Okay, so let me get myself on speaker view. Okay, and I'm gonna turn my camera here. Here's all the wax over here. <laughs> so, okay, I'll go, I'll go over things a little bit and speak into it a little bit more. Um, and then I'll kind of do a demo and I'll address some, some typical questions. And hopefully you can still hear me okay, since I'm sideways now. Okay, so here's my candle. Again, I've had it lit this whole time, again, to invite spirit into this space and to also acknowledge that um, we're not in regular space right now. We're in a sacred space when we are doing this work. Here's my bell. And again, I use this as a clearing. Um, and so I will typically ring this and speak some words, like a little incantation. So I will do that in a moment, but you can hear that. Um, this is my crystal. I literally have a crystal ball. <laughs> it is quartz. So you'll see me, I typically hold this. Um, and again, this quartz is good for clearing, right? So I'm trying to become the channel, the bridge between heaven and earth, right? And this helps clear that channel. And then here's my pendulum. I think it's brass. Um, I am not an expert on the materials of pendulums, but there, there are experts out there that can tell you kind of like the wands in Harry Potter, <laughs> you know, there's like, there's ideas about um, pendulums. And then here's my deck. Um, this is my little, I think it's nice to have like something that you carry the cards in. Again, this is all optional. Um, I think traditionally a wooden box is considered traditional, but I use this little like pouch, um, totally optional. But part of my, the reason why I take the time to talk about these kind of additional tools um, is 
just that they can help you access ritual space. So the action of laying out the cloth, lighting the candle, ringing the bell, these things become rituals, okay, that signal to your brain that we're not in Kansas anymore, right? We're doing something very different than like making coffee in the morning or going to work or stopping at a stoplight or these things that we have to do. We're going somewhere different. We're, we're trying to connect to that etheric or spiritual realm that we talked about with the magician card. So that's a reason. It's not about like, oh, this is so pretty. You know, for me, it's about creating the ritual. So I'll show you my ritual now. And I'm going to just do like past, present, future for myself. So um, I typically do some shuffling like this. You'll see a lot of readers do this. You know, some folks are really fast. I'm not that fast. Um, I like to do some like classic bridge shuffling. Some folks will tell you not to do that, uh, but I don't, I think it's fine. Um, and I will, I'll cut and flip a lot because I like to read reversals. Now, if you don't want to use reversals, then you're going to want to avoid flipping. Um, and there's really no rules about this. It's really up to you um, how long you want to shuffle for. You know, some folks just like to shuffle until they get a feeling that it's ready. Some folks like to shuffle in exactly the same way every single time in a very like uh, ritualistic way. Um, and that's great for the reasons that I just mentioned, right? Um, so, but really it's up to you. There's no rules here. Um, and if you're reading for another person, you might hand them the cards to shuffle themselves or that might not be your style. That's totally up to you. You might do the shuffling. Um, I got a question about, well, what happens if I'm shuffling and one falls? you know, or, or pops out in some way. I'm trying to make it happen, but I can't. Um, but let's say, you know, let's say that this card falls, okay? My feeling is you should use this card and it's a split second intuitive decision for me about whether it goes in the first position of the spread or whether it goes like over here as some sort of other theme or something. That's just me. You know, there's, again, there's no rules. There are some readers that that is exclusively how they read. They don't ever cut the cards. They only pull, you know, as they're shuffling, like whichever ones are sticking out far or falling, that is an option if that resonates with you. My style from here, once I've shuffled, I will put them down. Again, this is an idiosyncratic to me, but this I'll show you what I do. And then I take my crystal. I'll put it in my left hand. I'm, I'm right-handed. So I put it in my left hand. I take my bell and then I do some sort of incantation. I say something like, I'm calling on my guides. Please show me what is in my highest and best past, present, future. And then from here, I move the crystal to my right hand so that I'm pulling with my non-dominant hand. This is traditional. You wanna pull with your non-dominant hand. The idea is that you're bypassing the ego mind and you're connecting more directly with source. For most people, that is the left. But if you're left-handed, go ahead and pull with your right. From here, you have a couple options. Some folks like to spread the cards out in a fan. And then you might still be holding your crystal and then you're just like hovering until you feel something, you know, like warmth or a tug you know, something, something in your gut or your intuition that's like, yes, that's the one, you know, and then you would pull and you would place it for the spread. Again, you can, you can 
place cards face down to start, or you can flip them immediately. A couple options for you. So that's one method, the fanning method. My style is to cut the cards. And a lot of books will tell you to cut the cards like three times, like this. I never, that doesn't res, I don't do that. I'm not sure what the logic is behind that, um, but that's what a lot of books will say. So go ahead and do that if you wanna do that. I, I just tend to cut it once. I'm still holding my crystal in my dominant hand as a clearing tool. And I'm gonna take my non-dominant hand and I use what they call the knock method. So I'm gonna, knock and cut and the knocking and the cutting is it's another way to cut through the ego mind you know if we just most very few readers are ever going to pull from the top without cutting because the cutting is like one more layer of like connecting to that spiritual like or oracular channeling energy um, and cutting through, you know, like ego mind. I hope that makes sense. Um, so I've cut, I've knocked, I've cut, and I put them back down. And then from here, I flip. So past, present, future, you know, and I won't do a full reading. I want to leave time for questions. Um, but, you know, you can see that I have all minors, you know, I have two reversed and one upright, um, and then, you know, pentacles, wands, and we go from there and we weave, weave them together. So that was the demonstration. Um, maybe I'll just do it one more time and then um, we can take some questions or folks can start to kind of, we'll start to move towards wrapping up. Okay, so again, Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. I call on my guides. Please show me what is in my highest and best. Past, present, future. And then the last piece, this pendulum, the way it works is it's for asking yes or no questions. So when you first purchase the pendulum, you need to calibrate it. You need to ask it to show you yes and show you no. So for a lot of folks, myself included, this is what yes looks like. It's swinging back and forth. And this is what no looks like moving in a circle, kind of, <laughs> you get the idea. So this is good for usually just in your head, silently, asking a yes or no question that's helping you to grok what the meaning of a card is. What is it trying to say? And again, I find this particularly useful with reversals, just trying to understand, you know, why, what is the flavor of this reversal? Um, so, you know, again, these tools are optional. You don't need to run out and buy one of these. Your body is a pendulum. Your body is a pendulum. You have the ability to tune into your intuition and to navigate these cards, but it can be useful, again, to have tools because they help, again, they help us to like, signal to the brain and to the self, you know, that, that we're doing something different than normal. We're attuning to a different frequency. We're on a totally different radio station than we are normally. And it's what I would call the oracular mode. We're trying to become an oracle. We're trying to be a channel for information. So those are some thoughts about what we're doing here. <laughs> So awesome. Um, that was a lot of demonstration. I'm hoping that some of you just pulled cards for yourself. If you haven't yet, you could do that after we part ways. Um, 
And let's see. Okay, is there a specific way to shuffle? I hope I answered that question, Wendy. Um, let me know if I did not. Um, Renee, if you're ambidextrous, great question. Um, then I would recommend um, pulling cards with your left hand because most folks are right hand dominant. Um, and also if you think about um, kind of like Eastern cosmology and Chinese medicine, from what I understand, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the left side of the body is considered the yin side and the right side is yang. So the, the left is associated with the feminine uh, and the right with the masculine. And that's kind of, um, I think that spans a lot of different cultures in human history. And the what we're dealing with when we're trying to tap into the occult is the feminine. The feminine is dark and damp, that's yin. The masculine is hot and dry, that's yang. Um, so we're going into those damp, dark, like nooks and crannies of the psyche. And, and those are actually feminine places. So I would say if you're ambidextrous, tap in to the yin side of the body, which is the left. Okay. Any other Kate, questions? Yeah, Kate. Um, yeah. So I noticed that you said to pull with your non-dominant. Um, and But you said that your dominant was your right hand. And you um, you held the cards in your left hand, but you used your right hand to choose the three cards. So I'm confused. Pulling um, the cards is that is that shuffling them and knocking them, and then choosing oh, the cards is different. Yes, great point. Great point. Yeah. Um, I was like, really? But no, you're right. So, um, yes. Let me think how to rephrase it. I shouldn't have said pull the cards with your non-dominant. It's like, in my mind, at least, and others might disagree, but in my mind, it's like um, you are manipulating the deck to get to the point of the, car of the cards coming forward with your non-dominant. So if you're doing the fan method, you're totally using your non-dominant to do that pulling. But so you're preparing the cards with your left, correct. and then you are choosing the three cards with your right while holding them in your left. So, I mean, yes, but if you think about the way that I did it, right, I, I knocked with my left and I cut it with my left, and now they're already chosen. The three cards are right there. There's no more choosing happening, right? So oh, I see. You see what I'm saying? Yes. Does that makes sense? Okay. All cool. right, then how does, how does that translate to the fan method? So the fan method is a little bit different because the choosing is way more like loosey-goosey organic. Um, and that is where I would say stick with that non-dominant hand and you're, you're hovering over the fan with that non-dominant hand and you're choosing each card that way. Um, and, and kind of like pushing it out. Um, but once it's like chosen, you know, it's okay to like lift it with your dominant hand. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. okay to, you know, but it's the choosing that you want the choice moment, whether that's cutting or, or the fan, you want that choice to move through your non-dominant side to, to cut through. Thank you. Mind. Yeah, thank you. Great question. I love that little detective. <laughs> you caught me. Good. Okay. Other questions about anything that we've covered? We, it's 845, so we have a good 15 minutes. Um, and, you know, we don't want to go into too many personal questions, but if you have something that feels like it could benefit the group, please don't be shy. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi. Um, I, uh, I just got a new deck today. I, I can't find my old one. So um, I just opened this, this up and I remembered that, well, I didn't remember actually, one of the cards I pulled was this, um, it's kind of like a description card. It's kind <laughs> of like a tarot card. So just to give you guys a heads up, there might be one of these in your deck that you might want to pull out first. Yes. It's a new deck. <laughs> totally. Thank you. Mm, I love that. 
Awesome. There's some great info um, from Laura in the chat about um, giving some feedback for the library about what you'd like to see. So take a peek there, especially if you're local to Portsmouth. Other questions that folks are having, maybe um, if you've pulled your own cards tonight, maybe we can troubleshoot some stuff. Elizabeth says, I like the idea that the characters in the cards can speak to us. Yes, I do too. And I'll take it one step further, Elizabeth, and I'll say, um, and this goes back to the Jungian, um, the way this works so well with kind of um, therapeutic and psychological concepts, it's kind of like what they call parts therapy or gestalt pr practices in therapy, where you're actually entering into a conversation with different parts of yourself, right? So what is the part of you that is represented by the magician? What is the part of you represented by the devil? Right. And what we find when we start to work with the cards in this way is that we feel very identified with some parts and we feel very repulsed or, you know, um, fragmented in some way from other parts. And what the purpose is of all of this, of therapy, of tarot, you know, of dream work, in my mind, the, the, the common denominator here is we're trying to integrate. We're trying to take these fragmented, disparate parts of self, and we're trying to bring them into union and communion with each other. Um, and the, you know, the word whole and healed, they have the same etymological roots. In order to be healed, we have to become whole. But in order to become whole, we have to honor and acknowledge all the ways that we are fragmented. And I think this tool is so beautiful for that kind of deep work. Yeah. Okay, another question. If you're reading for someone else and a card doesn't seem to resonate, what kinds of questions could you ask to help them connect with it? Yeah, so I love that question, Laura. You know, if a card's not resonating, it might be that it's not resonating with you. It might be that it's not resonating with them, or it might just be like both. Do you know what I mean? And so. Um, you know, this happens to me when I'm reading professionally, like back to back people, like it, sometimes it's like you have, a, you have the flour, you have the eggs, you know, but the cake doesn't rise type of thing. And so I will typically, when I'm reading for another person, I will typically go in one of two directions. I will either, um, share from my own personal experience even to the point of like anecdotal stories about my relationship with the card. I will draw from my own experience. That's again, that's not, um, it's not like cheating, you know, it's not like I'm making it up. That's part of that, that's included in this practice. Um, or if that doesn't feel like the right tack, then um, I will just do the ink blot thing. <laughs> it's the Rorschach test. What do you see? You know, particularly in one of the more kind of busy, you know, like think about um, like the tower or even the lovers. Um, I will ask the person like, do you see yourself in this card? And, you know, where? And it's, it's a remarkable what people will say, you know, like you'll, people will say like, I see myself in this tree. I see myself in the mountain, in the tiny mountain in the background. And you're like, whoa, you know? And so, yeah, on a certain level, reading tarot is like reading ink blots, you know, and that's okay. That's like, you're not making, you're, it's not fake, you know, it's totally real. So that's how I would answer that. I hope that feels like a good answer, Laura. Um, Patty, shuffling the card cleanses, does, so shuffling the cards cleanses them. Yeah. Um, is it cleansing? I don't know if I would use the word cleansing because I will say that your deck needs to be cleansed periodically. Um, and my favorite way to do that is to um, put all the cards in order, right side up in order, and then put them on a windowsill, maybe in the sunlight. Um, you know, you can also use sacred smoke if you do use sage or palo santo. I know those are controversial um, plant allies, but, um, you know, smoke is cleansing. 
Um, so I do think it's useful, and this is true of all magical tools, like I think it's useful to cleanse them periodically, really intentionally, or maybe like with cleansing crystals like selenite or something like this. Um, so I think that's, that's what I associate with the word cleansing. I think the shuffling in, in the context of a reading is more, um, it's a sim, it, to me, it's similar to using the non-dominant hand. Like it's a way to get out of your head and into like an open space where whatever you're about to say, it's not that um, you're saying it, it's that it's being spoken through you. Right, so it's not, what should I say? It's what needs to be spoken through me as the channel. That's what, that's what this oracular mode <laughs> that I keep mentioning, that's what it's really about. And, but it's hard to get there. Don't feel like, you know, you're not gonna be the Oracle of Delphi in a day. You know, it takes time to really um, get into that space because we're so unaccustomed. <laughs> to being there, you know, nobody wants you to, nobody's talking about that, like at your nine to five, you know? Um, so, okay, that was a tangent. Um, I hope that helps, Patty. Do I have a favorite card? Um, I, yeah, so I mentioned Mary Kay Greer earlier. Um, she did a lot of work, again, with numerology, and she did a lot of work with what she called um, a, a life path card. And so if you've ever done numerology with your birth date, and if you've ever gotten down to a number, you can also apply that number to a tarot card. So my birthday reduces down to two. So I am really partial to the high priestess card. I really identify with that card. And Mary Kay Greer would say that that's my life path. That's like what I'm here to embody. Um, so I love that. Um, and maybe I can, if I remember, <laughs> I'll try to get that little tidbit in the email that we send you to, because it's it's fun. Um, okay, Eric, can you use one deck for say other people and use one for yourself? Yes, totally. Yes, I'm a big believer in like cultivating really special relationships. I mean, every deck you buy is literally 78 masterpiece artworks. There is just so much goodness in there and more being published every day. Um, and, you know, I have lately, I've finally like broken away in my professional readings and I will have three or four decks on the table and I'll just feel the person's vibe when they come in and make a decision in the moment about which deck is for them in the moment. Um, so really the sky is the limit. They're like potato chips. You can't just have one. Um, but I also want to be clear that you don't need more than one. You know, this isn't about like going out and spending all your pocket money because that's really easy to do. <laughs> oh yeah, I love that question. Okay, Janine, when you are reading cards for yourself and when you are being called to multiple cards for a question, is it okay to place some cards back after you've pulled them if you don't feel they resonate and keep going until you do find one that feels right? like good, better, best fit? Ooh, wow. This is a good question. I think I have, I'm of two minds, Gemini. Um, on the one hand, there are no rules. You don't have to do anything. If you get a card and it doesn't feel in alignment, put it back. You know, there's no, I, I, I really don't believe that there are rules here. On the other hand, I mentioned before that tarot is, in my experience, and there's memes about this, so I don't think I'm the only one. Uh, tarot cards, they're very tough love. They show you things that you don't want to see. Um, and they will, a lot of times, if you do cultivate a daily or a weekly practice, they'll keep showing you the same card over and over. So, I think it's totally fine to put cards back, but I think if you're putting them back because you're feeling triggered or you're feeling, you know, threatened or vulnerable, that's a different, that's something to look at and be honest with yourself about. That's different than putting them back because you're like, oh, I wasn't ready. Like I, 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 I wasn't in ritual space. My channel wasn't open. 
I'm not feeling that, you know, zinger feeling that we're kind of working toward. Um, that happens to me. There are times that that happens to me. Um, there will be times, even after you have gained some proficiency, there will be times when you pull cards and you put them down and you're like, I don't see anything. I've got nothing. Like, it's like, whew. and what I would say is, maybe you should pull more cards or maybe you should walk away because maybe you're not supposed to be here right now. Maybe you're supposed to go like wash your hair because you haven't washed your hair in five days. Maybe you're supposed to eat dinner because you haven't eaten in 10 hours. You know, maybe you just need to, maybe you're pulling cups because you're dehydrated, girl. <laughs> go drink some water. You know, they can be so like literal. So, okay, I'm on a tangent, but I think that's a great question, Janine. So, um, if if you if you have a further question, go ahead and, and type it if I didn't quite answer it. Um, Darcy, I don't have a tarot deck. What do you recommend for a first deck and where do I get one? I live in Portsmouth. Thank you, Darcy. Yeah, so in Portsmouth, there's scallops, um, which is on Daniel Street, a couple doors down from the press room. Um, they have cards. There's also cards at um, the health food store over you know, going towards the mall, whatever that street is. Um, I think they have a few decks, not a huge selection. Um, if anybody, if I'm missing something obvious, people can put it in the chat. Um, there is Barnes and Noble. Barnes and Noble has tons. It's actually kind of wild, um, but I, I'd rather that you support scallops and a small business, right? Um, and recommendations, you know, um, I would say that, you don't have to get a, a version of the rider weight. Um, if you do, I'll put in the chat, um, Centennial Edition, Smith Rider Weight. Um, this is, uh, it might be hard to find it cheap, um, but this is what the back looks like. These are cards that have recuperated the, the original coloration intended by the artist. So I'm a big fan of that. Um, I just noticed that it's 858. So maybe I can make some suggestions in the email about some good um, beginner decks. And also that that decolonizing question I think is great. Um, beautiful. I know there's a few more questions here. So what I'm gonna do, great suggestions too. I'm gonna go ahead and save the chat. And then if there's anything that feels really pertinent, I'll try to address it in a little missive to everybody. Um, I do want to be respectful of time. Oh yeah, Bull Moose has them too. Yeah, cool. Okay, um, Laura's got some stuff in the chat. I've got my stuff in the chat. Um, I'd love to hear from you. If you hop on my website, you can um, book a reading with me. And... Um, you can also um, sign up for my newsletter if you wanna hear from me. I won't spam you. I'm only sending them out eight times a year with the pagan holidays. So I'm not spammy, I promise. <laughs> oh, awesome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. It's really like such a joy and an honor to have such a big group. I just feel so, so blessed by your presence. And thank you to the Portsmouth Library. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much, Kate, for hosting. We really appreciate it.